So, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Julien Vier de Galbert, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, the testing firmware uh, DevOps way. So, first, about firmware, what, what I will present you is mostly about uh, system firmware, so what you might call uh, BIOS or UEFI. Uh, it's the firmware that starts your computer. But the, the testing framework I will present could be used for any other kind of firmware where you have a console and you want to monitor stuff. And in particular, I'll talk about Linux boot. So uh, who already know what Linux boot is? Ah, not bad. OK. <laughs> yeah. My talk is not about that port anyway. Uh, so um, I'm working for a company that's uh, selling uh, open computer hardware uh, and uh, uh, the brand name is Sesame and we are um, mostly uh, selling uh, second hand hardware. So we are getting back uh, hardware from uh, I, uh, hyperscale data centers and we uh, test them recertify them and send them back to a new market because uh, most of the OCP uh, hardware is really hard to, to get. It's getting a little easier now, but uh, uh, if you don't have a very high volume, uh, the vendor won't sell you anything. So if you want a few pieces, uh, like a rack, just come to us. Uh, and during this recertification process, we have to update the firmwares. Uh, mostly, uh, some servers are like four or five years old, and you need to update just for security reasons and stuff like that. And the alternative is to uh, install uh, Linux boot on those. So why? So yeah, f first, what? So at least out of the, the room know what uh, Linux boot is. Uh, the idea behind Linux boot is to place the Linux kernel inside your uh, flash chip for the BIOS. Um, that was presented last, uh, last year here by John Hudson. And um, the idea is basically um, a recent uh, BIOS, UFI BIOS, is doing two stuff. The first stuff is bringing up the hardware, and the second stuff is finding where UOS is and booting it. And for that, it needs a network driver, a drive, uh, a file system driver, stuff like that. All those features are already in Linux. So just the idea here is just to use Linux for that. So we keep some part of all UEFI, or you can use uh, core boot, and then we jump to Linux to start Linux boot. And there's two parts, the Linux kernel, and then a user alone that will basically uh, implement all this uh, booting policy. And um, in our case, we are using uroot, which is uh, um, a user land generator written in Go. So we have uh, Go files that will do all those uh, DHCP requests or scanning disk and then just booting your next kernel with the k -exec. So why are we doing that? Uh, because using the old BIOS is like uh, just finding the latest uh, available BIOS for those machines, and we want to be able to update stuff more regularly. So uh, having something we can compile is better. And if a customer has a problem, at least we can look at the source. Uh, for security reason, uh, as I said already, we are putting Linux, so most of the case, you want to boot Linux. So in your security model, you already have Linux, so it's not something else to audit, like UEFI. Uh, it's uh, easier to, uh, to update. And in the UEFI BIOS, we can update the microcode. But if we build everything ourselves, then it's a lot easier. And we could also add extra features. So I was saying we have some like five-year-old system. Uh, when those systems were designed, um, NVMe drive didn't exist. So the BIOS is not able to boot on PCI Express. It just doesn't have a driver for that. 
And by using Linux and a recent version of Linux, yeah, the driver is here. Just tell our other software to try the NVMe drives, and that's it. It can boot. Oh, and yeah, one very interesting point is the infrastructure integrations. So if a customer has a, a, a small data center, or I mean maybe internal or public data center. Um, he mostly have, um, he certainly have some infrastructure that's uh, um, say, provisioning the machines and stuff like that with database and internal software. And um, at, at some point with the current system, what you have to do is convert those to um, uh, Pixie Boot most of the time. And if some of you have used Pixie Boot, it's a pain. And what you could do with that is just have your Linux boot uh, directly get to your uh, infrastructure and fetch through HTTPS or something the configuration you need to boot. And it's just regular protocols or recent modern protocols and not uh, old Pixie boot with TFTP that most of the time doesn't work. So that could be really useful. And the title was testing, so we're going to test. Uh, what were our test requirements? Uh, it's automated testing, so that's the default part. Uh, the main reason is uh, in my company, the team is currently one. We are hiring, someone is interested. But <laughs> so I can do uh, all the tests, like the BIOS vendors, they have an uh, army of testers and they try all the menu and stuff like that. We just can't do that. So we need something automatic. We wanted to keep the logs uh, output of all the tests. And as for log, we have uh, three basic sources. Uh, the test outputs, of course, the um, serial console of the server, and uh, the, um, the network console. So it's uh, the PMI console here. Uh, basically, there's a protocol for uh, managing server remotely. And we can connect to it and get uh, this another serial output. Um, in most testing stuff, it's, uh, at least in Go, it's more like uh, non verbose by default, and if you just verbose, you run again, you get all the output. And all tests are kind of long, and most of the time we need to boot machines. It could take a few minutes. So if you have to change the options to run again to get the output, it's not, an I it's not ideal. So the idea was more to get all those logs, uh, but display them in a way that uh, only the important information display first. And if you want to go to details, you can open some stuff. So the hardware setup behind that uh, was presented last year in the same talk about Linux boot. It was the second part by Jean-Marie. Um, the idea is. Uh, we have uh, hardware data centers where we have our uh, servers, one at the uh, device of the desk, and the other server is uh, controlling it. Oh, this one. It's better. Okay. So what I was saying, yeah, we have two server, uh, one for controlling the other one. And the second is what I called here the DOT, device under test. Um, the idea is the device under test uh, as it's flashed, replaced by the flash simulator, and there's a relay to control its power. And the other computer, uh, the other server is just driving the flash simulator and the, uh, and, um, the relay. So today I will mostly focus on the software that's running on that and not on this, uh, this hardware. So let's have a look at, uh, at that. So this is uh, the output uh, of the tests. Uh, so as I was saying, I wanted something summarized. So everything is uh, just one line here but uh, we still have uh, a lot of details inside the tests. 
that we can open or we can uh, open everything at once. But it gets messy, but that's the goal. Let's close that. Um, the second point, what oh, this test was great. The second point was we want to get the log output of the server. So it's in this uh, small kind of video. Uh, unfortunately, it's not on the top. So that's the server booting. But I tried to put it on the top and try again. But I can't see the bottom line, so. Uh, that's better. Let's go back here. So this is a uh, test recording of an actual server booting and running a um, small test that you can see uh, on the on the left. So the test is basically booting. So we've seen here with the FF at the top, the um, part in the EFI bootloader. That's the Linux kernel booting now. And uh, at some point, starting uroot. Just here, we've seen very briefly the uroot banner. We've got to a shell, and the current test is trying to reboot the server. Because I had an issue where the server would boot once, current test flash for some reason, and never boot again. So the test is rebooting. So here again, uh, we have uh, the EFE part of the Linux booter, Linux boot, uh, the Linux kernel is booting, sorry. And we'll see your root quite soon here. And we got to the U-boot shell, so it's just a basic shell where we can boot another server. Um, so uh, those this video is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, as Kinema, so if uh, some of you know about it, we can copy past text from here, etc. It's just pure text. Uh, one interesting point of integrating that in a, in a test framework is that here I have uh, match points. So my test is matching when the Linux boot uh, banner is displayed. And if I click on here, the video sits back to this matching. And here we have the the Yerud banner. So it's just the bottom line over there. Welcome to Yerud, etc. So it's really easy for debugging. You can match where it was in the video and then play, go back, and stuff like that. The second feature was the same with, uh, with two videos for the two uh, console. Basically, in that case, uh, we'll skip a few of it to here. And those uh, two videos are the record of the web serial port and the EPMI port. And basically, the serial port is the real console, so we have uh, all the message from the kernel. And on the other one, there's just, uh, um, just a shell connection. So we have the Euroot logo. And here again, the, the, the video are synchronized. So if I click here, I get to uh, a point where it matched the Yerud banner on the second one, I guess. And the time recorded here and there, it's exactly the same. So we're at the same timestamp for both videos. was it for the demo and uh, we'll go more into details on how it worked. So first, uh, all of that, all of the tests that was run are written in Go. So why am I using Go? It's just because the user land we use, uh, Uroot, is also written in Go. Uh, I had to look at Python for writing tests, but I'm not trained in Python, so it was a lot longer than just reusing Go here. So if, uh, if some of you are interested in using Go for testing whatever else, this could be a 
useful for you. But uh, Go test output is more like text-based and really a summary. So to have the view I've shown, you need to do some, some development. Um, so Go test, uh, the test from, uh, from Go is really uh, integrated into the language. Uh, it will uh, uh, it will compile uh, files that's named underscore test dot go that are mixed with the rest of the source, and in that uh, in those files, all the functions that uh, match uh, tests uh, as in their names will be what is called uh, test case or test suite in most uh, test frameworks. And you can create subtests, so all those tiny windows that are opening in, in my first example, uh, calling t.run. So I, I put a short example of what it could look like in uh, to do some tests in Go. It's just like uh, calling a function and comparing the expected results and display the, the difference when there's one. Uh, and if the function doesn't trigger an error, then Go will just uh, don't do anything and uh, don't display anything, just mark them as okay. So the output of that is something like uh, uh, I, compile my I test my package and it says just it's okay. If there's, a, if there's an error, it will say, okay, there's an error in, the, in that test function and that line with that message, etc. And if you ask for the verbose version, then it gets uh, those four lines for the okay test. But when you have a long test and it's hard to pick the fail in the middle of your long logs of, of okay, okay, okay. Especially since there's no color in the default uh, go output. But uh, go test has a JSON output that's basically uh, just uh, the different uh, event of starting and uh, stopping a test plus all the log outputs. And all that is written in, uh, in JSON, so we can post-process that. And that's exactly what uh, I've shown you is doing. So I've shown the GoTest web application. It's a web app. It's written in HTML, uh, CSS, and JavaScript. It parses the Go JSON output that I've, sh I've seen, I've showed you before. It integrates with the schema players and renders uh, the way I've shown you, so it keeps the hierarchy, and there was no error in that one, so only when there's an error, it will just stay open and in red uh, instead of the green part. So uh, this is already on GitHub. Um, it uses a few uh, common web technology like Bootstrap and jQuery for the front. And a few other m less known that some of my colleagues gave me uh, as a starting point before acting on that. So ReactiveJS is a templating engine in JavaScript. And RequireJS is something that's able to uh, pack several JavaScript into one minimized version. But as written over there, hopefully nobody understands what I'm saying because I'm not a developer and I hope you're not too. But if there's one that could help and fix some strange behavior, maybe uh, one day. For now, it fits. It fits our needs. So that's enough of JavaScript. Let's talk about Go a little more because uh, that's where you're more interesting. So the Go side of it, this is in a package that I called Tastevin. Uh, it's basically grouping the um, Go functions that are used for testing the embedded, uh, embedded software and uh, a few packages that's used to generate the, the web view. So the name was uh, kind of, there is another tool in the Linux boot community that has a name that based on a, a wine, it's called Fiano. And Fiano is an Italian wine. And this tool in Linux Boot is, uh, um, is used to manipulate uh, uh, UFI, UFI images, flash images, uh, to, remove the, um, to remove the Dixie drivers and replace them with the Linux kernel and the uh, user line for Europe. So that's basically the first 
uh, tool in Go that I contributed to. So that's, that's where I rounded up in, uh, in developing stuff in Go. So um, Tastavan use a, a package called Go Expect. Um, if some of you know the plain old expand tool in TCR, uh, that's the same but written in Go. Basically, the idea is uh, you wait for a regex, you send some strings, you wait for a regex, you send some strings, etc. Uh, it's mainly used like uh, you wait for the string login and you send a login and you wait for the password and you send the password. Um, it has what they call spawners. So a spawner is what will open your connections to what you want to test. So it could be a command so you like you're in your Go software and you spawn uh, uh, telnet something and it will, it will uh, uh, open the terminal and monitor that. Uh, it already has an integrated SSH connection so you can spawn uh, to remote server and it will open the remote PTY and they have a generic one where you can customize the connections. So in test of I added three different spawners. Uh, serial spawner that connects, of course, to the serial port, because that was one of my requirements. So that's used the generic one and does the wiring. Uh, I had to contribute a few stuff in uh, Go Expect for that to work. Uh, the EPMI spawner, it's just using the command light line tool, uh, EPMI sol, sol for serial overlap activate, and use the command spawner from Go Expect to run that. And I also did a QMU spawner for testing with QMU directly. And of course, that can be extended. Uh, and they have the concept of a batcher. So a batcher is a, a sequence of actions. So the expect send sequence uh, presented in a Go slice. So a slice in Go is a dynamic array, basically. And Go expect has uh, three main primitives. Uh, be expect to match a regex. The be expect T, where you can change the timeout from the default to a new value, and be send to send a string. So the example could be like that. Uh, if you describe your uh, your structure, and uh, he in that case, um, really doing what I was saying before, like matching username and sending what's in the variable. Uh, username then expecting password and sending what's in in the password pointer and you can extend that and I extended that to add a new primitive the bxt log which is the uh, same as bxt plus it prints a log and that's the one uh, I used in the askinema uh, to synchronize the askinema view from the the main stuff because the the JSON will have the timestamp for each log, so uh, matching that timestamp will seek the video. The next part is about the writers. So uh, basically in, uh, in Go, there's this concept of uh, interface. Uh, so the idea is um, there is the writer interface and everything that needs to write to something like a socket, a file, or, or, or anything else uh, is not written like I write to socket. It's written like I write to whatever writer interface. So you can replace that and use another interface. And what I've written is the an schema writer. So whatever written to that uh, interface will be. Uh, Converted to the Askinema format by adding the current timestamp to it. And uh, it's actually a write closer interface, so it can detect when it's closed. So the file will, uh, so the system will log uh, the open and close of the, of the file to, uh, to the test log. And the web port can match that uh, to find the file names to know what to give to the Askinema player. There is another one that's called 
script another tool in Unix that called script replay that does basically the same thing in the terminal, but it has two files, one with the plain log, another one with just the timing information. What was good here <laughs> is to have the plain log um, as uh, a file, so you can download the log and just read it, because sometimes the video view is not the more useful one. So to summarize all the package, uh, Therm are basically extension to a GoExpect for uh, spawning on serial EPM ion QMU, uh, adding the batcher uh, with the log, writing the, the, the SKinema and script replay uh, format. The system to control the EM100 is the flash emulator and the relay, so to control the, the machine on the CI. And there's the basic test suite that does all the matching, uh, the Linux boot prompt, etc. And a few utility package because uh, there's some stuff in Go that you have to rewrite all the time because they don't have generic already. So yeah, it's planned for Go too. And there is a command, uh, Go test in just one word run that will basically uh, wrap the go test dash json command. So run the test suite and it, it will uh, save the json output. But instead of displaying that json output that is just don't want that on your terminal, it will uh, redisplay that the what go test would have displayed when it's okay. Uh, not exactly the same when there's an error because of some context reason, so I just get that. Or you can ask for the verbose output and you get uh, everything but plain text, not uh, JSON. Uh, I added to that tool a serve uh, version where you just give him the directory where the JSON and the asking in a video are, are recorded and it will open a window in your browser by serving on local host files. And uh, at the beginning was like testing, testing like DevOps, so we need a CI. So all that is uh, easy to integrate in a, in a CI. You just put the directory where the JSON output and logs are saved in your CI artifacts. And I've added this uh, go test gem that will generate the index HTML for your particular file. And uh, Yeah, and in that case, it can uh, also export all the JavaScript application in the same folder. And as I was doing it, I just thought that we could do a live mode, so basically mixing uh, both the, the serving and the running in the same. So uh, here I'm testing a stupid application that's uh, sending uh, step one and waiting two seconds be before sending the response, etc. for steps two, step three. So we can see the lines appearing on the, on the JavaScript. Uh, and once it's done, the um, SKNM player appears. So here it's uh, artificially longer than uh, expected, but uh, for real tests, it could be really useful to have a view of, of what's running on before waiting for the, the end of the test. Unfortunately, the AskNema player is not able to stream, so we really need to wait for the end of this particular test for the video to appear. That's why the space was empty at the beginning. And uh, in this example, I've made a failure. So the failure stays open while the other test gets automatically closed. And uh, so for that uh, live demo, basically the Go application is serving the web server that's open here in Chromium and running the test suite at the same time. Uh, yeah, the only 
only trick is uh, instead of serving a file, it's using a WebSocket to communicate uh, the, the data live. So that's basically it. Uh, everything is uh, on GitHub already. And uh, I hope it can be useful for something else than just testing Linux boot. So uh, feel free to test it and contribute. Uh, oh, I have another demo that I forgot. Uh, something to show about the, the CI integration. So this is a test in instance of GitLab in a VM. So it's running remotely uh, somewhere. Uh, and uh, where are the buttons? Uh, it's not the same color. Yeah. So it's in that version. So basically, there's a. a on this version, there's a GitLab uh, integrations, and I'm running here the Go test uh, um, test suite, and in this uh, pages uh, stage, I'm running the Go test uh, uh, jam to generate the the output. And if we go back, uh, I couldn't see the full window. If we go back and we go to the CI pipelines and we look at the last pipeline in the pages here. So this is the basic output from uh, the GitLab test, but we can browse the artifacts and there was an error, no, okay. And in the artifacts there, we have this index HTML, which is basically the output of the test run on the CI. So it's the same as we've seen before, except that it's not wide enough. And we have, uh, we don't have the IPMI test because this is in the VM, so I don't have the, the real server, but uh, this one works. And we still have the video run on the, well it's just a basic test on that one, but run on the CI. And that was it. So if you have any questions. It looks really good. And the, the question is, have you considered using Lava? Lava? Uh, I don't know much about it. So no. <laughs> uh, in testing things other than Linux boot, let's say for example, a BIOS, a UEFI, whatever. Um, if you're only getting postcodes out and they're not null terminated or new line terminated, then would Go expect or, and Go test still work in that case? So I'm looking for postcodes. I don't have the verbose output. I just have postcodes. Would just it still work? Yeah. Over so just hex. Yeah, just hex. Um, I hex over your app? Yeah, it should work. Okay. Um, not 100% sure go expect will not wait for new lines. That, that's what I'm wondering because I remember using expect for something before and I had issues when the output wasn't ASCII. Uh, oh, it's binary, yeah. completely binary. It wouldn't work. But uh, <laughs> I don't see a reason to not uh, uh, convert those binary to uh, X, text X with new line or 
and then feed that into the into the Go expect. So okay. uh, as there's a writer interface, there's a reader interface too. So it could probably oh, okay. uh, convert something in in between. Okay, and then my next question is what do you do when the system, for example, stalls or hangs on boot, or maybe in the case of like a watchdog, the system just resets in the middle. So you have um, in your test cases, is there something that checks for the system just completely resetting? And are you able to detect that or, and the hang condition as well? I'm currently at a stage where I do really basic tests and was mostly working on this test framework than actual tests. So I've not encountered that uh, kind of uh, watchdog or, or hang error yet. So Fair currently enough. I do nothing. Fair enough. <laughs> So um, you have tests that run on the host that look at the console of the of like a system somewhere yeah. else or, or a console or a QMU. Do you have plans or if you're working on the framework, do you already have something to, I guess, especially more in regards to Linux boot, running tests inside your guest or well, your device under test, you know, Especially in Linux, but if you if you're running, if you have the test, do you have facilities to I guess get the JSON back from the from the console and then execute tests on the device, on the device. itself? Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons for writing this in Go was to be able to use uh, Go remote procedure call from uh, the tests to the fir the firmware on the test at some point. So hopefully could be able to run uh, on the device uh, through that. And uh, after like running go test on the target and getting the JSON out back to that display, uh, it should be possible. And there's no reason to uh, only use the wrapper to directly display that. Except I've not done anything to embed some tests in other tests uh, as two different runs, but it shouldn't be that difficult. Yeah, of course. I'm just asking if you're, you know, prepared for this to happen. Yeah. So, uh, who is implementing the tests, and are they specific to a certain hardware, or are they like generic? Sorry. Are the tests generic or specific to a certain? hardware like certain server and who's implementing those tests um, the tests should have uh, both some generic tests for like Linux boot in general okay. and some specific for the the hardware we, we sell okay. and currently as I was saying at the beginning the team is one it's me so mm -hmm. there's not much tests mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm trying to uh, get help internally and externally on that. So writing the tests, I guess, most of the tests dependent on the hardware will be written by me. And for the U root, there is already, uh, already a test suite I need to integrate with that because they're running only on uh, QMU, uh, on like on Circle CI or GitHub. So I have another question. There is this uh, automated testing summit. Uh, are you going to attend that and cooperate with the other people who do automated testing of uh, low-level components like bootloaders and kernels? Uh, when is that? Is like uh, after ELC the day after the day after ELC? But you have to register. Yeah, you have to register separately. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Uh, I think we've seen that uh, too late. So. <laughs> I'm currently going to ELC, but not uh, not the day after. So it's um, and the the lines was uh, like it's higher level than what I'm doing right now, but maybe it's not the impression we had. Automated testing summit its presentations this year. Is 
Is the foreclosure approved? Sorry? What's your favorite wine? <laughs> I have to say champagne because I come from there. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for, for having me.